in cropping systems, so introducing a, a totally different species to the rotation for you know, disease and um, pest and, and weed breaks. Or as a quick catch crop, so if a, if a crop doesn't go in or you just got an opportunity for something quickly for two or three or four months between then and your next winter crop. Green summer feed, I mean this year there should be a reasonable amount of green feed holding over into summer but the last couple of years were a good example of um, you know everything browning off and not having some good quality tucker for your animals. There's also an opportunity for topping up your fodder reserves or especially fodder production for different, for different end users. And of course, for you know, finishing off your animals, animal performance targets. Um, there's a good role for some of these crops in uh, the crosses over into things like uh, dairy adjustment. And again, as a break crop in terms of um, improving your ground for and setting up, you know, setting up for success as far as new pasture establishment goes. So we'll just run a, run through a few different um, different groups of varieties if you like. So most people will be familiar with the brassica options. Uh, forage ropes were sort of widely used in much of northern Tasmania. Most of the brassicas are you know, very good energy, pretty good protein, um, relatively useful levels of NDF, so uh, fibre at levels which um, encourages good intake. And all those things combined together offer opportunity for good animal performance. Over the last 15 to 20 years, perhaps a little bit longer, there's been some hybridisation done between rape and some other species to produce these leafy turnips. And some of the benefits of those are they're a little bit faster the first grazing, so typically six to seven to eight weeks, rather than perhaps waiting 10, 12, 14 weeks for your rape crop. One of the benefits of those in the past two, is, or still currently, is um, probably more competitive with um, your brassica weeds. So if you have got background brassica weeds that, you, that you're worried about flowering and setting seed, if you, can, if you can put one of those in and you can perhaps be grazing the paddock in six to eight weeks and uh, get in front of or at least keep up with the, the background radish population. Summer turnips are fairly widely used in intensive systems, um, often usually break fed. Typically their um, maturity time is 10 to, 10 to 14 weeks and um, high yields are very possible, you know, 10, 12, 14 tonnes a hectare of dry matter for a very modest outlay. Then there are longer season keeper type turnips, so there people might be familiar with things like uh, Mammoth Purple Top and Green Globe, which are brilliant for keeping for 14, 16, 18 weeks, maybe out to 20 weeks, and with the right nutrition and the right care, they can be quite flexible in terms of, you could feed them off a bit earlier if you need to feed in a hurry, or they can, or they can be reserved. And they also probably cope with some lax grazing or on-off grazing a little bit better than what the summer type turnips do. The latest species are the Swedes, and the Swedes are capable of very high yields, but they have quite a long growing season, and typically we're sowing them in Tassie in, from late November through to oh, mid to late January. Um, they do suit um, perhaps usually a bit more extensive applications, so they can handle lax grazing, sometimes used in elevated areas. Very modest sowing rates, like the keeper turnips, only sort of you know, up to one to two kilos per hectare, so you're looking at an outlay of seed of, you know, maximum somewhere 15 to 20 kilos a hectare so brilliant value in that sense also very high in dry matter and have the ability to um to be grazed left and come back and and, and they don't spoil quite so easily as the keeper turnips do so flexible if you want a long season um forage crop there's been a renewed interest in kale in tasmania over the last two or three years um probably in the 1980s and through the not and through the early 90s there would have been um, tens of thousands of acres of kale sown in Tasmania in, in the back, back country of the northwest coast in particular has the capacity to, to, to grow a very high yielding crop if well looked after talking um, examples of this year of the summer, summer, summer crops from last year fed off this winter have been um, 18 to 20 tonnes of dry matter or higher from a December to January sowing and fed off through May through to August and um, I won't talk too much about it, but another option to throw in there, of course, is the grazing canolas, which um, I know that some people are considering sowing very soon, so they can be very flexible for your cropping, crossing over into grazing operations. Okay, chicory is sometimes viewed as a, um, as a, as a perennial option. Um, probably its biggest fit is as, as a short-term forage to get the most out of it for a period of 
perhaps two to three years. There's a lot of chicory sown in southern Australia, which is sown in October, November, or perhaps a little bit earlier, um, late August, September. And it's used as a summer forage from late spring through summer into autumn, and then either over sown with grass again or going to the next cropping phase. And very high, very high yields are achievable. Some of the um, um, trial work that's been conducted under good management has demonstrated yields of up to 16 tonnes of dry matter per hectare off chicory, just for a nine month summer crop. And with chicory comes terrific metabolizable energy, good protein levels, and really low fibre. So talking fibre levels of around 26, 28 to 30 NDF, which encourages terrific animal intake. So either fed, fed alone, or in combination with some other co-species, and quite often sown with clovers. And this uh, picture here is taken from James Clutterbuck's place a few years ago, where he had a chicory and red clover crop in, and um, you know every, all the grasses and everything else were browning off around it. And you know this was firing on beautifully. It's just a little bit of moisture. So ideally, you get those in earlier on to make the most of the season there's still probably an opportunity to sow them now and still under the irrigation still get some useful life out of them through the through the autumn time but also consider it as a as an option for down the track um, for maybe a two to three year specialty finishing finishing paddock and it's also another sort of a grass free option that you've got to um, help perhaps manage your grass grass weeds out of your paddocks With a couple of warm summers and um, people looking to top up hay and silage sheds over the last couple of years, there's been um, increased interest in millet. These couple of photos were taken um, um, just out the back of Wynyard last year and it's a millet sown in late October up that way. Probably down this way you probably want to go just a touch later because it's a frost sensitive species and uh, you'd like to perhaps sow it maybe early November. Millet on its own is still useful but it does tend to have an average um, energy level and sort of modest to high fiber levels so it can be quite useful to include a co-species with it which will offer some protein some more palatability and just sort of shandy down that fiber level a little bit in this case the, the operator used um, Persian clover so if you, look, if you read most of the literature from the mainland some of these annual clovers you know the same as an autumn crop growing through the winter and they finish in October November December in many parts of Tasmania, some of these annual clovers are actually useful spring planted and they'll carry through the summer into next autumn, so don't discount them. And uh, Persian clover is a, is a pretty handy one. It's also an opportunity to perhaps establish some other perennial clovers under your paddock, so white and red clover, good species with, with millet. And there's lots of examples of people um, in southern Victoria using species like chicory and some of the forest brassicas in combination with the millet. The other, be other benefit that millet sometimes offers to the brassica operation is um, because the brassicas can be a little bit hot and high in protein sometimes and extremely palatable, just having a small amount of millet in a brassica crop might shanty down some of those concerns and you end up with something which is um, probably has less issues around as far as animal health goes and probably less concerns and probably just a slightly more balanced diet. So I'm suggesting here, um, November, December sowing is, um, is pretty handy for millet. And there's other silage and hay options out of, out of millet as well. Or you can just graze it through and um, by the time we get, we get our first frost in sometime in April, it'll um, just about stop and dwindle and disappear. If you're making silage out of it, um, don't be surprised if it sort of goes a funny colour when you cut it and, and it starts to cure. It'll sort of go a grey brownie colour and look a bit odd, but it'll be fine. Alright, there are some pockets of interest in Tassie for forest sorghum. Um, it doesn't work everywhere and doesn't work in all years because we don't quite have enough heat units all the time. Some seasons we do, last year was a good example of some real success stories with sorghum. You need something like 700 to 800 um, a day degrees to, uh, to achieve a, a reasonable sorghum yield. And we need um, soil temperatures of 15 to 16 degrees to get a good establishment. There are some varieties which um, probably tolerate a little bit more of a cool start than that but to get a reasonable, reasonably reliable germination you sort of want that, that temperature range and this sort of area we're not sort of hitting that temperature till second or third week of November typically. Um, some years it might be a touch earlier 
and then some locations might be touch early where you've got a bit of a sun trap, a little valley, or the right sort of hedging around the paddock. So mid-November to early December, but um, but high yields are very possible. I haven't got this to scale. This soil crop that was at Bridport about five years ago, and that's about eight feet high. So uh, high yields are very possible. Alternatively, the crop can be grazed, so people are getting you know, a couple of grazings or one grazing and a reasonable um, silage or hay cut off at the, at the end of the year. Probably those ones, not the sorghum yeah. sorghum. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So I'll just point out, so in sorghum breeding and hybridisation, there's lots of different crossing that goes on by the plant breeders. Um, the Sudan grasses are typically finer in the stem, have better tillering ability and some capacity for a little bit earlier cold start. So. Um, they're probably a bit more flexible for, for the southern part of the, of the continent. All right. well, we'll, we'll go and have a look at a bit of vetch shortly. Um, over the last two or three years there's been an increasing interest in, in vetch. Um, partly on the back of um, some enthusiasm out of uh, dairy operators in Victoria who find that uh, the cows tend to like the vetch more than loosen hay. And um, so people have been dabbling in it and um, there's some reasonable areas that have been sown over the last couple of years. When I first sort of um, met vetch, if you like, back about 15, 18 years ago, on the North West Coast, people were autumn sowing it and it was hopeless. It sort of sat there and sulked and got covered in weeds and didn't like the wet and all that sort of thing. But then when we sort of um, get, had a few operators go to spring sowing it, or from sort of late July, August, September, depending on where you are, then uh, we're starting to get some, some really nice results. So it's either sown alone at uh, reasonable sowing rates or at, um, in, in mixtures with cereal where it can stand up in the crop a little bit. post emergent herbicide options are pretty limited at this, at this stage still, but um, as far as a quick catch crop goes, that maybe that's not too much of a concern in a lot of circumstances. Vetch is you know, closely related to faba beans, not too distantly related from peas. It um, requires a group ERF inoculant um, we're finding that um, the, the silage and hay yields have been pretty good in Tassie. We haven't done any trials as such, but we've done some demonstration trips of different species and different sowing rates. And this sort of August, October sowing window seems about right. Now, within vetch, commercially available, there's three species Vicious Sativa, which is the common vetch, largest seed, probably the most easy one to grow. For a couple of reasons, it's larger seed, gets out of the ground a bit faster, um, looks a bit more convincing early. Plus, it doesn't really have any concerns around seed toxicity compared to the other species. There's other ones, Vicious Velosa or Woolly Pod Vetch and Purple Vetch, Vicious Benchalensis. Um, there's a level of um, prussic acid toxicity that can actually occur in the seed, and so we sort of advise people to cut those before the seed sets and don't graze any stubbles if you have let the seed set because there can be some animal toxicity issues around them. Common vetch can be fed in animal rations, um, the seed, the grain up to about 40%, so that's a far, far safer option. So if you're thinking about um, adopting vetch, perhaps stick to the common vetch because there's a few less detonators on it. The woolly pods actually have the opportunity for probably 20 to 30 to 40% higher yield potential. So um, if you really are chasing yield, then uh, perhaps consider the woolly pods. We'll have a look at a couple shortly. So, just a bit of a summary. There's quite a range of options. I mean, I haven't touched on a few other things like, um, you know, fodder beet or uh, uh, some of the other sort of subtropical species that people are dabbling in, like um, cow peas and lab lab and soybeans. But um, they're not probably they probably really are on the margin of their range down here. But perhaps some of those other ones are, are, are a useful opportunity. One of the great things about a lot of these options is they're really low cost. Um, brilliant, you know, you can probably sow a, direct sow a uh, brassica crop into a cereal stubble for um, seed cost of you know, 30, 40 kilos, uh, dollars a hectare at the most and end up with um, a terrific amount of feed. Most of them also have pretty good water use efficiency. So the subtropical species like millet and sorghum, we're looking at sort of three to four to five tonnes of dry matter, yield potential per megalitre of water. And the brassicas are not far behind that, so typically two to four. So we talked about the green feed over summer, so we're addressing a green feed gap, um, having an option for some green feed through summer and early autumn, and we normally have a, a bit of a feed deficit in autumn where, you, where you're getting 
crops established for your winter program. But like any you know, good outcome, you know, you want to plan when you're going to sow it, plan your harvest time or when your grazing time is going to terminate so that you have still some um, daylight hour and some soil temperature to, um, to get your winter program underway. So important to think about that, that end of season. And some of these subtropical ones that uh, people are interested in, like millet and sorghum, don't go too early. You'd be much better off to wait a week or a week and a half, wait for the soil temperature to be right, and get them underway then, because the crop will catch up. Okay. Oh, go and have a look. Well, we're going to have a look. Go and have a look to the vet.